following podcast was recorded on Monday, February 10th, 2025, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research at Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim will provide an update whether inflation is becoming unanchored. Jim, the Fed Fed Chairman Jerome Powell's last press conference, which was less than two weeks ago on January 29th, he stated longer term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored as reflected in a broad range of surveys, households, businesses and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. What are inflation expectations? See, that's a good question. So if we go to the first slide, we need to understand what we're talking about. And I think Dan Torillo, he is a Fed. He was a Fed governor from 2009 to 2017. Um, left the Fed in the summer of 2017 and in October of 2017 gave a presentation at the Brookings Institute. And I like to joke, the best Fed governors to listen to are the ones that recently leave because now they tell you what they think. They're just not reading the talking points they're handed. And he said that they have no reliable theory on inflation, monetary policy without a working theory of inflation. And this was um, the the abstract from his paper that you're looking at. Um, you know, and I'll just read quickly what he said. In this paper, I will draw two conclusions from my experience about uh, monetary policy. We do not at present have a theory uh, for uh, my, uh, the dynamics that works, a theory of inflation dynamics that works sufficiently well enough to use for business of real time policy making. The psychological, uh, sociological point is although, is though certainly not all good monetary policy makers that were formerly trained have almost an instinctual attachment to some problematic concept and hard to measure variables. Now, what does that mean in English? I've argued inflation is the single hardest thing in all of economics to forecast. Why? Because so much of it is this psychological component. Do you think it's a problem or don't you think it's a problem? It's not just a mechanical component. Just, just add up all the measures and that's what inflation is. You can what is the unemployment rate? Just add up all the jobs and all the people that are unemployed, and that's the unemployment rate. It isn't the psychology of, well, people feel like they're going to lose their jobs, so we raise the unemployment rate. It doesn't work that way, but it does with inflation. So what he's trying to say is all the theories we have inflation, but of course we know what causes inflation. It's money supply. It's government spending. Or it's this. His argument, which he's correct, if you study it, there is no the correlation is zero. It doesn't fit. And we're all tied to some psychological point. I don't care if the correlation is zero. I'm telling you it's money supply that drives the um, the inflation rate. That's what he's arguing. And he's right on that. And there's this psychological component that the Fed talks about with inflation expectations. Do people believe that we're going to have inflation? And if they do, the Fed uses a phrase called it's unanchored. If they believe that there isn't inflation, they think inflation is well anchored. And as you pointed out in Powell's quote two weeks ago at his presser, and he says it at pretty much every presser, they believe it's unanchored. Uh, I mean, sorry, they believe it's well anchored and it's not a problem. How do you measure inflation expectations? So that's a good question. There's lots of measures. So if we go to the first one, there's surveys. The big survey that everybody looks at is the University of Michigan. University of Michigan surveys about 3,000 people uh, or thereabouts. They ask them a bunch of questions. We all know it for the, their consumer confidence survey, but they ask lots of other questions. One of the questions they ask is, what is your outlook for inflation over the next five to 10 years? The number that they are reporting is that people think that inflation will average 3.3%. As this chart shows, that is the highest level since 2008. Now, in June of 2008, something else was happening. Crude oil prices hit $145. They're 70 now. They're less than half that. So if you say, well, I understand why it peaked at 3.4% because crude oil prices were out of control and gasoline prices were going vertical. Okay. Well, 
that's not happening now. So when was the last time we saw a 3.3% five to 10 year outlook without an all time high in crude oil prices? Now you gotta go back 30 years. So that's a problem. And this is the median. The median is the 50th percentile. So if we go to the next chart, the next chart shows you the mean, the average. The average is up to nearly 7%. That is spiked to a 40 year high. Uh, and so why is the average so much higher than the median? If we go to the next chart, the next chart shows you what's called the interquartile range. The top 75th, the 75th to 100th percentile. So the top 750 of 3,000 people asked, think the inflation rate is going to average 9.2%. They think we're going to have hyperinflation. The bottom quartile think it's going to be 1.5. The bottom, the green bars in the bottom show you that spread is the widest it's been ever since they've ever been producing this number. There is a wide disagreement about inflation. So the surveys are saying inflation rate looks like the inflation expectations look somewhat unanchored. People are starting to get very worried about inflation and they're much higher than 22. So if we jump to the next chart, the next chart is what about businesses? Okay, well, the best measure you could use for businesses might be wages. Uh, and so this is from the average hourly earnings from last week's payroll report. Uh, average hourly earnings rose half a percent in January. That equaled January of last year, October of 22, equaled, equaled the highest rate since March of 22. Remember, we had 9% inflation in June of 22. So this equaled the highest wage number we've seen since the 9% inflation number. And if you look at the year-over-year -year number in orange on the bottom, we're back about 4% on wages. Remember the rule of thumb, if, if the average wage increase in the United States is 4%, the inflation rate could be 3 to 3.5% because everybody's getting enough money to pay that extra inflation. So businesses are suggesting that there might be some unanchoredness to inflation. The next one is forecasters. So if we go to the next slide, this shows you, Bloomberg does a survey of about 70 economists. One of the questions they asked was, what is your outlook for the inflation rate? So I took the second half of 24. So in Q3 is in blue, what they think the CPI rate's gonna do, and Q4 is in orange, and the vertical line is when the Fed started cutting rates. Inflation expectations are going up for the second half of the year. There is a widespread expectation that we are going to get more inflation in the second half of the year than we have now. It's going higher. It's looking more unanchored. And then the final chart is, um, uh, is about the financial markets and it needs a little bit of context. Chairman Paul was asked, about the rise of interest rates uh, over the last couple of years. And basically, he was he was asked about what, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong, let me back up. Over the last couple of months, since September, the Fed started cutting rates, interest rates went up. Why? Well, he went on to say, it's principally about the term premium expanding and it's not about re increased inflation expectations. Okay, he's right and he's wrong. He's right that it's about term premium expanding. Quickly, what is term premium? Term premium is, uh, is basically if you own a 10-year treasury yield, 10-year uh, treasury security, you're currently getting about a 450 yield. But what if you owned a one year and a one year and one year in, in a year and another one year and two years and another one year and three years all the way out to 10 year? And you could look at what those market implies those yields would be by looking at the swaps curve what would your yield be? It would be lower. And the difference between the two is term premium, the extra risk that locking yourself in for 10 years you're taking versus all these perpetual one year or six months or two year notes, because you can always end that arrangement in one year or in six months or in two years, whichever one you pick. So the 10 year is getting you extra, risk, extra yield because there's more risk. He's right term premiums are rising, uh, but the question is, are the term premiums rising because of inflation expectations? You don't know that. 
because term premium can't be dissected into some of it is liquidity, some of it is inflation, some of it is real growth, some of it is Fed policy, some of it is this, some of it is that. You can't, I mean, economists have attempted to do it, but the error rates are very large. All you could really look at with term premium is the top line. So he's trying to deflect. He's trying to deflect by saying it's term premium, it's more risk, but it's not inflation expectations. I happen to think he's trying to say it's Trump's fault. Is what he, It's not my fault. Don't blame me. Blame the orange guy is what he's trying to say. So we go to the final chart um, You know, in this section. The black line shows you now let's switch back to inflation break-evens. This is a different measure. It's not additive to term premium. So if you look at this, the black line shows you how much yields have gone up. The orange line shows you how much inflation expectations have gone up over the two-year tenor, over the five-year tenor. How much inflation do we expect over the next two years? How much do inflation do we expect to go up over the next five years? Since the Fed started cutting rates and the interest in 10-year yields have been going up, the black line, two-year inflation expectations went up by far more and five years went up by nearly as much, meaning the market thinks that over the next two to five years, we're going to have more inflation, just like the economists, just like the surveys, and just like businesses. So at every level that we measure inflation expectations, it is telling us there is an expectation we're going to get more of it. And when did this begin? When the Fed cut rates. It didn't begin two weeks ago when Trump started talking about tariffs. It began before we knew he was going to win the election when the Fed cut rates. Why? Because I believe the market was saying the economy is doing okay. We've got elevated inflation expectations. If Trump wins, we're going to get deregulations. We're going to get permanent tax cuts. The tax cuts we have now are temporary, but we'll make them permanent. We're going to get all kinds of stimulus in a strong economy. We're fine. Thank you very much. Jay, if all you're going to do is cut interest rates, you're just adding to the inflation fuel, and you're trying to deflect and saying, no, it's term premium. It has nothing to do with our policy. I think it has a lot to do with your policy. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any questions on Bianca Research, Arbor Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.